From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on February 8th, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 28th episode of Matters Microbial. I am very grateful to all of you who watch and or listen to this podcast. First, a member of my Wunderkammer relevant to today's podcast guest. I am not well-traveled compared to many, but some of my students are well-traveled. Today's guest years ago sent me this pebble from Greenland, complete with beautiful lichen. The close-up shows the beauty of the lichen even more. I admit, I treasure such items from former students. The third week of my introductory biology course and lab here at the University of Puget Sound continues. My students continue to purify their water bottle buddies, as I call them, in preparation for next week's colony PCR to amplify the 16S ribosomal RNA genes from each isolate for analysis. I also gave them an opportunity to learn about the use of microscopes. They stained and observed their own cheek cells, which amazed them. The nucleus within a single cheek cell contains all of the DNA of the student. Unraveled, it would be two meters long, all in a package within a cell that cannot be seen without a microscope. Most of my students are painfully aware of my alarmingly intense interest in tardigrades, and they are very charismatic subjects for microscopy. One student managed to make this video using her cell phone camera. I think the video needs background music, don't you? I do like to let interested people know, just as there are many paths to microbiology, there are other paths from microbiology other than being a professor. After all, I spent about seven years working in the biotech industry in San Diego before returning to academia. So many microbial processes are vital to various aspects of everyday life, even including food sciences. Thus, it is a genuine pleasure to introduce Dr. Francis Gilman, Principal Scientist at the Kraft Heinz Company and Doc Martian number 13, to chat with us about her path in microbiology, studying microbes in Greenland, and making the transition, transition to industrial biotechnology. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Franny. It is so great to see you. Hey, Mark. It is great to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be invited, and I had no idea I was lucky number 13. <laughs> Who better, right? Exactly. Yeah, glad to be here and uh, looking forward to, to chatting about kind of um, alternative career paths out, out of coming out of academia. I find a lot of people have interesting ideas about what it is to be a microbiologist, and it doesn't really matter uh, what the truth is necessarily. Uh, there's a lot more to it than most people think. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to have you talk about your career path. So this isn't, we can talk about old home week another time, and I, we have lots to chat about that. But I think it's good to give some people some insights into what made you interested in microbiology and started you on your path. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, and I'll, I'll start from the, the beginning, but to preface, yeah, currently I'm a principal scientist at, at Kraft Heinz. So currently in um, the consumer packaged good CPG food industry. Uh, but yes, as Mark alluded to, I got my start in, in your lab, Mark. Um, and I, well, actually you were my freshman academic advisor. So we met, I checked uh, before, before this podcast, I checked, we met about 17 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. So I started, uh, I was lucky enough to have you as my advisor, went through um, kind of half of undergrad thinking I wanted to be a veterinarian. Turns out I love dogs, but don't love blood. Um, so you helped me 
find a, a path into research and really hooked me on microbiology. I even remember the very first paper you shared with me on um, looking at the microbiome on hands. Yeah, left, left hand, right hand, different communities. Blew my mind. Um, super fascinating. Got hooked. Was fortunate enough to work in your lab on uh, studying the microbiome of lizard cloacae, lizard cloacas, with uh, Stacy Weiss as well, who uh, is still at the University of Puget Sound. Um, just a fantastic experience, an interesting environment to be working in. I loved every moment I got to uh, talk about uh, the lizard cloaca and help educate what, what that is. Um, I think I even got a, an award for one of my uh, presentations for how, you did. how well I described it. Yeah. Yes, you did. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I really, I've gone from from the uh, cloaca to, to CPG, consumer packaged goods an unexpected career path, uh, certainly. Um, but I was hooked on research, hooked on microbiology, thanks to you. And, and I am very, very grateful. You know, few people have uh, that been provided that gift of, of passion and, and extreme curiosity. So that's really helped me drive my career. So thank you for being a fantastic professor and educator. I'm extremely grateful. Um, so you helped me find a path in research. I was definitely interested in getting my PhD. So out of UPS, I ended up at uh, the University of Montana. I really loved the idea. I was, I was, um, I am outdoorsy. I love the environment. It kind of seemed like a dream. Like, oh, maybe I could be like a field microbiologist. You know, I was always a little jealous. Loved the lab work, but I was jealous of some of my friends at UPS who got to do research, you know, and they'd go out to these beautiful places. Um, I was like, well, what if I could do both, you know, lab work, microbiology, and be out in the field? Um, so that was in part what led me to the University of Montana and joining Dr. Bill Holden's lab there. So he has a microbial ecology lab. And I also loved uh, what he was doing in his lab and that he had a kind of a diverse array of, of projects and different uh, ecosystems um, he was working on. So I joined to work on soil in his lab. And uh, initially I got to do a rotation project on soil remediation. I was really interested in that idea of bioremediation. Again, loved that aspect of like environmental biology microbiology and that application. So going into grad school, I was already starting to get that drive for that, that application desire, you know, finding, finding new things, but then using them right away. Uh, so I found that very motivating. Um, that project pivoted because I got the opportunity to work on a collaborative project with folks at um, the University of Copenhagen at the Center for Permafrost and Perm. Very fortunate to have that opportunity and work with a, a collaborative group of scientists. Um, that was unique in that it it was it was diverse. You know, different kinds of scientists working together on the uh, common theme of climate change. So my uh, project within that umbrella was studying microbial uh, responses and contributions to climate change in Greenland permafrost. Yeah, so I got to work with uh, geologists, hydrologists, microbiologists, and I really found that motivating as well. I really liked that kind of ecosystem of different perspectives and working on a team like that. Um, and of course, absolutely amazing to be able to go to Greenland. You know, not many people have that opportunity. So I went in 2013. And that year I was on Disco Island at the Arctic station there. It's a uh, field station. Um, you need to, you know, I flew to Denmark, then flew to uh Greenland, had to take a, a ferry, you know, it was not easy to get to, um, but absolutely beautiful. Um, I was there over the summer, so it stays light all day, which is great for grad students. You know, we can just work 24-7, collecting <laughs> samples. <Yeah. laughs> 
Um, and, and, you know, just looking out uh, at the water, we could see whales go by as we're collecting samples. It really is truly phenomenal, a very special place. I think we have some photographs uh, that, that you've sent that you've sent. And, and there's one of you on, with blue skies behind you, which is, is, is lovely. And that just shows you, what is that, 10 p.m. at night or something? And, you know, now that's what, like t over 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago. So I don't remember the time exactly. But, yeah, that is at one of our field locations. Um, in that photo, you can see the water. You may be able to see some of the um, actual, like, field site set up. So we're studying, get collecting soil samples on either side of a snow fence. So that allowed to see, you know, how snow accumulation may impact the microbial ecosystem in the permafrost. Um, we had little chambers set up on the soil that were made of plexiglass that helped to increase soil temperature a few degrees. So we could also see the community response to, to temperature change as well. And then you were on the ice. Yes. So um, my advisor, Dr. Bill Holbin, was also very passionate about undergraduate research opportunities as well. So he got funding for us to go back to Greenland. Uh, so I think that was 2014. And we got to take undergrads with us as well. So for that project, we, yeah, it was really great. Um, really, again, very fortunate. Um, we collected samples on the Greenland ice sheet. So we were at a different location on Greenland for that, um, Conger Lusak, and also went back to DISCO as well to collect samples um, at, from the Arctic station. I think it's interesting to note for the listeners and viewers that microbial ecology is you're trying to find out the diversity of organisms there. I'm not even going to address some of the challenges in assigning um, taxa. I won't even say genus and species because they're much looser than what we're used to with animals and plants. But that diversity could be very, very important. And seeing those changes that take place to come up with, with really important questions is vital. So I'm really proud of what you did with that, because that's kind of fusing your interest in climate change to this. And so you got your PhD. Yeah, got my PhD. Um, as I was wrapping up my PhD, you know, how so how did I get to industry? How did I, uh, my, net, my job coming out of PhD was with a company called Blue Marble, Blue Marble Biomaterials. Um, and it was, again, sort of by luck. Um, by the situation. So I was wrapping up grad school uh, and I was running out of money. So some of this was financially based, just the reality of the situation. I didn't have anything immediately lined up and a local startup was hiring for a microbiologist. Um, so it just seemed like a, a great opportunity to, to stay in the area. Um, I love Missoula, Montana. Um, so I was excited to to find an opportunity to stay there. Well, maybe I, you know, got the chance to try out industry and think about uh, if I would want to go back into academia and find a postdoc. So that would be, I thought that would be a good, good location to stay. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of by chance. And really, I, I love teaching. I love, you know, that energy of people getting excited about learning new things, sharing knowledge. That was motivating. Um, grant writing, less of a motivating factor for me. So I, I was thinking like, oh, I want to stay in academia, but I want to be like uh, Mark Martin when I grow up. You know, I want to be an awesome professor at a smaller institution. So I was anticipating staying in academia, going back to academia uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but the, the startup bug really bit me. I really enjoyed working at Blue Marble Biomaterials, I really enjoyed the business side of things, um, which I wasn't expecting. What kinds of things did they produce for you over there? Yeah, Blue Marble, uh, again, was a startup. So uh, at the time I joined, they had pivoted semi-recently from biofuels. So the company was founded mm -hmm. and got its start in biofuels, but had pivoted to making uh, food and flavor ingredients. Uh, primarily specialty chemicals. So by that, I mean kind of smaller volume manufacturing. Uh, we we're making compounds like buku mercaptans, which are sulfur compounds, uh, kind of stinky, but are actually found in low volume of like certain berry flavors. Uh, so we manufactured compounds like that uh, via kind of green chemistry pathways, 
but also different ingredients from fermentation. So that was my introduction to industrial fermentation. So, you know, I had this foundation of microbiology, microbial ecology, but less so fermentation. Um, so I was really excited that, to have the opportunity to learn about that. And again, I, I've been very excited and motivated about that application piece. So it was really enticing to, you know, learn new things, but then get those into action right away. Um, create products that, you know, sh are cleaner, better, more sustainable than other uh, options in the marketplace. So this is really remarkable because what I like is the way that you've maintained your interest in sustainability and you're still using microbial processes to do so. In addition, the idea of a lot of different, and, and I hate some of the nomenclature and jargon that people use, the share, shareholders or the thought, the thought leaders, all this kind mm -hmm. of terminology comes up. And I understand it because I used to have to work in it. But the point is you've all these different people with different levels of expertise and types of expertise work with you. And that can be very gratifying. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that exposure to say working with someone in marketing um, and not just uh, on the research or science side. I, I enjoyed those cross-functional uh, collaborative opportunities and thrived off those. And what was especially nice being a, uh, at a startup, it's a smaller company, it's moving very quickly. Uh, so I had a lot of growth opportunities and I needed to and was allowed to wear many hats. So sure, I started, you know, as a scientist there working at the bench, working on a lot of hands-on projects, but quickly got opportunities to, again, work sort of in a business development role, working with our marketing team, working with sales, working with manufacturing and quality. So it was really nice to um, get that broad view of how a business operates. We call it mahogany row when you start to work in administration, but I don't oh, know uh -oh. If, in Missoula if it's, if it's mahogany row. <laughs> No, and we, you know, in a startup life, it's a little more bootstrap too. So, right. Yeah. So, one of the things about startups that uh, I think most people have seen alluded to is some of them are successful quickly, some of them fail quickly, some of them morph and change. So, this idea that you have to be willing to pivot and, and move from one thing to another, even from job to job, is much more common than you see in academia. Yeah. Um, yep, you have to move quickly, adapt to change. Uh, James Stevens was a co-founder of Blue Marble and still a mentor of mine. Similar attributes to you in that, you know, kind of a voracious learner, very creative. Um, I really like working with people like that. Um, so he definitely is able, was able to steer our company through a lot of challenging times, um, figure out when we needed to pivot. And so that was a, a learning curve, you know, and sometimes, you know, it is really hard to go through those ups and downs in a company. You know, you get to know a lot of people very well um, and to see some folks leave at certain times, that's tough, um, really hard. What was great for Blue Marble, uh, we were ultimately acquired. Uh, I got to help play a role in that acquisition process. So that was a successful end for the company, which was great to see. That did ultimately lead to me finding a, a new opportunity, uh, a new company to work with. So coming out of Blue Marble, um, I did want to, you know, my common theme in my career is sort of, again, you mentioned my interest in sustainability. You know, I am very passionate in how microbiology can be used to enhance sustainability. And I've really focused on, on the food and agriculture industries. So that's really kind of me in a nutshell and how I intend to keep growing my career as being a leader in that space. So coming out of Blue Marble, I was like, ooh, what do I do next? And I was doing less with soil. I was like, wouldn't it be cool to kind of get back to that, get back to my roots uh, per se? Um, so that that's what led me to the agriculture industry. So Blue Marble was more so food, flavor, some cosmetics. Um, but I joined the Terramax team in the Twin Cities to work in agriculture. They produce uh, crop biologicals for 
commodity crops like corn and, and soy. So think, think probiotics, but for plants. That's awesome. And I, I love yeah. the idea of it. Most people are used to the idea of using, say, members of, of the rhizobia as inoculants for leguminous plants. That is to form a root nodule that fixes nitrogen, reducing the reliance on fertilizers. I kind exactly. of did my PhD. I did my PhD yep. work kind of close to that. But not just that, you were able to work in a situation, and I've seen it all over the place, where having a look at the microbial ecology of the soil can actually enhance productivity. Yeah, an analogy I love, um, and there have been a few review articles on it, is kind of comparing the, the root uh, rhizosphere to the the gut. So similarly mm -hmm. to how we all talk about the gut microbiome, you know, we need to support um, a healthy gut microbiome in our guts to be a functional, healthy individual. Similar concept with plants, right? We need, the plants need to support a healthy microbiome around their root systems to exchange and maybe get nutrients that they need from the soil. And, and then that lasted for a period of time, and then you made your transition to? Yeah, and then I have now ended up at Kraft Heinz, uh, which is great. And how, how did I get here? So now I'm based in the Chicago area. Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so what's kind of funny is, you know, as a young 17-year-old, I was ready to get as far away as, as I could from home, you know, so ended up in Tacoma and have slowly went made my way back. Um, but it is really great to be in your family again. Um, but how did I get back here? One thing to highlight is, is network and network is important. I think both in academia and industry. So when I was at Blue Marble, uh, we did, I did interact with folks at Kraft Heinz. I had not anticipated that I would end up here, um, but had a wonderful working relationship with many people um, several years ago, again, when I was at Blue Marble and an opportunity came up, they thought of me and it was a, it was a really good opportunity. So I decided to take it. Um, you, yeah. you, you know, it's, it's really interesting and I want to emphasize this. I mean, everyone is familiar with the problem in high school where you'll ask somebody, hey, do you know so-and-so? And then they'll say something really terrible about that person. And then you'll say, well, that's my boyfriend or that's my girlfriend. We've all had that embarrassment happen. And so what I what I told you and what I've told to all my students is that, and this isn't a pun, microbiology is a small world. And as a result, it's really important to not, I don't want to be extreme about it and say burn bridges, but you want to be kind. You want to be pleasant because you can never predict how the networks work. That's not put elegantly, but you know my point. Yeah. Well, right. You never know. Um, yeah. You don't know how the networks work. Uh, you never know who you might need or encounter again. Um, and I, I feel like a, a pin you have or another common thing we've talked about, like it's not that hard to be nice. Let's be kind to right. people. You never know what other folks are facing or going through. Uh, it's easier to be kind and nice anyways. So yeah, build it takes those. less energy. It, it takes sure less does. energy to be nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't understand it. Anyway, so I'm delighted that you had kind of sowed the seeds, if you don't mind my being a little agricultural, to send you to Kraft Heinz. What is your official title? I know you're a principal scientist. Yeah, yeah. My official title is uh, principal scientist at Kraft Heinz, and I'm on uh, an amazing team here. Uh, we are part of, I'll describe the structure a little bit. Um, I'm part of the R&D department, so research and development. And uh, within our core R&D team, I'm part of a group that does a lot of the upfront innovation and discovery. So a lot of more early phase projects, which I really enjoy. Um, we're a team, we call call ourselves the engine team. So we have folks with a variety of backgrounds within this engine team. I'm on our fermentation biotechnology team. So I work with um, several other amazing microbiologists and scientists within my immediate team. Yeah, I, the great, great people. Um, team and who I work with is one of my key motivating factors. Um, so I really, really love uh, the group I'm with here. Um, so we've got the fermentation and biotechnology team. We also have our analytical sciences group. So a lot of the scientists that work on 
um, you know, manufacturing analytical capabilities and other um, analyses as well. So the analytical team, the nutrition science team is also within our group and ingredient science. So think um, flavor work, flavor perception. That's some really neat concepts I had never encountered much until here. And that's really fun to think about. Um, and some product development happens on our team as well. So really cool team. We call ourselves the nerd herd. Um, it's great. Yeah. You know, I have I have to tell you, when I worked for a company in San Diego in biotech, we were using bacterial polymers as food additives, uh, yep. both for fat substitutes uh, and then also as a suspending agent. And it was so interesting to talk to the people that were doing the commercial apl application versus the people like me that look like slimy – look at slimy colonies on plates. And, and look at those particular ideas together. And, and it is a very interesting way of looking at it. And it's, it's, it's less open-ended than, than doing research in academia, but you have the satisfaction of knowing what your product is. Yes. Yeah. And, and we love our slimy colonies as well. That's still an active area of, of research um, in the food industry, different uh, EPSs coming from microbes and how they can be used as ingredients in food. Um, yeah, different, different scope. Uh, so you are not frequently kind of digging as deep in your research projects. They have a business end goal um, and they may not last as long as, as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful. Um, do you have some particular – I don't know what you can and can't talk about. Do you have a particular microbial product that you can talk about? I'm, I'll talk high level. I'll talk an area that I just have particular passion about just as an example of, of why it's pretty cool to work in the food industry. Um, so even, even at my time at Blue Marble, I got my introduction to a filamentous fungi called Aspergillus oryzae also known as koji mold. Um, it is gorgeous. If there were a microbe you would want to cuddle with, it would be koji mold. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, when you grow it on, on rice or even other substrates, soybean or, or wheat, it grows. It's the strain I have experience with uh, is very white. So it looks just very, very fluffy, white, almost like a cloud. It's beautiful. It's cute. Love it. Um, it's an enzyme powerhouse. It's used for miso production, soy sauce production, breaks down starches and proteins and, and generates a lot of flavor that way. So I was introduced to that uh, filamentous fungi at Blue Marble. have also been um, looking at that within Kraft Heinz. So Kraft Heinz has several fermented food products in our portfolio. We make Philadelphia cream cheese, Claussen sauerkraut, is fermented. Um, we also have uh, soy sauce brands internationally as well. So yeah, I've had the opportunity to talk with teams uh, in Indonesia and China working on soy sauce. And again, I just think that koji mold is fascinating. I think the process to make those fermented foods is amazing. The, micro the microbial ecology of it is neat to think about, but just even the manufacturing process, very cool. So I did... What's great about Kraft Heinz is they've been very supportive of um, continuous learning and providing opportunities to do that. So I had, I was um, lucky to have an opportunity to go out to Indonesia uh, and work with colleagues there to see soy sauce being made um, in, in real time. How, how related is this aspergillus to the one that's used in the making of tempeh? Uh, it's different. Uh, I think... Typically in tempeh, it's a rhizo uh, rhizopus. I think I might be Rhizo saying it wrong. I, I think you're right, rhizopus. But you you know, you know what? I don't know about the actual pronunciation. You know, but. just say it loud and proud. Yeah. So typically a different different fungi, but I also um, I, I find that fascinating as well. I think it's a really these fermented foods again very cool academically in terms of the microbial ecology, uh, but also delicious and, and healthy foods. So I think that's a neat, neat opportunity in the food industry right now. I mean, even when you look at the production of kimchi or sauerkraut, you get all these changes in the microbial composition as the fermentation continues. 
And I think sometimes people don't realize how much of that is really microbial. And I'll talk to people that have been making their own um, sauerkraut or their own kimchi and are kind of unaware it's microbial, but it is. It is. Yeah. And another amazing uh, opportunity I've had here is I've been able to work very closely with our culinary team. And we've had a lot of fun uh, collaborations on the fermentation side and on fermented foods. And it's been so rewarding and fun to kind of cross pollinate, you know, on the kind of culinary, making a delicious, delicious food product. But then also me sharing some of that microbial ecology and technical side. Um, it's It's been a hoot. Doesn't it make you laugh when you have a situation where you have all these lab rules that you're never supposed to eat in lab? You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And at the same time, they bring you things that they made in that lab for you to test. Right. By eating it. Yep. Yeah. And here, yeah, eating is a big part of the job here. So we have a lot of labs where it is totally okay to eat. Um yeah, it's again the food industry. It's I was not planning to get here. I'm so glad I did. It is fun. Food is fun. Food is delicious. You know, we'll have our normal. We all have our own projects going on, but we all need to help out on taste tests. So you know, there'll be a call like, "Oh, we need tasters for mac and cheese." You know, that's not a bad day. I guess I'll go help out with some mac and cheese tasting. So mac and cheese is one of my favorite things that shouldn't be. Is there a microbial component to that? Is that what you're suggesting to me? Uh, maybe. I, I won't share any, any nitty gritty details there. <laughs> no, this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. You know, Franny, when I worked with um, bacterial polymers as food additives, there was something when they were making food items with it, the polymers, that was interesting. We would refer to it as mouthfeel. In other words, if we made cookies with it, they would ask us, how does that taste to you? And that's not a big quantifiable sort of, of thing. It's more of an emergent property. Are there elements of that in what you're doing at Kraft? There are. Um, sometimes me, less directly, but that is a, a really important piece. You know, flavor is king, as we say, but there are other components that are very important to how a consumer perceives their food, mouthfeel being one of them. Um, and we have a whole sensory, sensor, sensory team that collects that data uh, with employee panels where we help contribute to those efforts. Uh, we'll also take product samples um, outside for consumer testing as well. Uh, but, but yeah, it's a complex process. You know, the mouth feel, the mouth coating, flavor release, uh, flavors that are perceived up front versus later as you're eating. It's it's pretty fascinating. So the next question I'd like to I'd like to ask you, Franny, is 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 there any evidence of any of the work that you've been doing, how the what impacts it might have on the normal human microbiome in the gut? Great question. Gut health is uh, very big in the food industry right now, so that's something certainly on our radar. Um, with a company like Kraft Heinz, you know we don't take high risks, you know, so we are very careful. We make sure there's science to back up any claims we make or um, products we have on the market. Yeah. Um, so you do need to be a little careful these days when you're going out to the grocery store, see things like probiotic or whatnot on the labels. But but um, I, I think it is a cool space. Um, so I am passionate about the gut health space. I do think there's a lot of opportunity to make good products backed by data, backed by science that do help people. I, I think that that's a really good way to look at it. A lot of times people look at industry that without consideration for this, but I think everybody has noticed that this is something never far from your thoughts. So as long as you're involved, there's going to be that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm, I'm glad to kind of provide a glimpse behind the brand, you know, I don't think, especially with a big company like Kraft Heinz, you know, you don't get to see the folks working on products, but we, again, I work with phenomenal people. I work with people that are very passionate, passionate about making good products, tasty products, products that are good for people on the planet. Um, we really want to make a, a difference in a good way. Um, 
And I'm excited about the opportunities for gut health. I'm excited about the opportunities fermented foods might have for gut health. I think more data needed there. You've had some great guests talk about that as well. Um, so we, we keep tabs on that research. That's wonderful. One of the things that I hear a lot from people is, you know, eat local, eat healthy, et cetera. And then when we look at like, for example, my favorite thing, macaroni and cheese, these are the things that are the quintessential processed foods. So do you have some thoughts about how your work has impacted that concept? Yeah. Another uh, hot topic in the food industry right now. So that kind of highly processed, processed food. Um, and I am not the best or most up-to-date on how we're maybe how consumers are defining that, but that is a key issue for the nutrition team that I work closely with. So obviously on our radar within Kraft Heinz, um, and we are passionate about, you know, fulfilling consumers' needs for less processed, if, if that's what is needed. Um, and again, I think that's where microbiology, fermentation, you know, are there, are those perhaps more natural processes that would be more uh, well-received from consumers? So can we produce more foods or food ingredients from fermentation? It's a long way from Crisco, isn't it? Long way. And what I'm trying to, to think about now, this is a nice description. I particularly like your, your Koji mold description. I think that's going to be very interesting to people. How do you see yourself continuing to evolve? Will you always have kind of, I, when I say itchy feet, that's not microbial, but will mm -hmm. you always have, will you always have itchy feet for another position because you've been moving from place to place and doing so well at each of them? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know. And I feel like I've kind of long-winded maybe describe my journey. Um, and it, yeah, there's been different steps. I've gone to different companies, uh, but it's been very valuable to me. I've learned a lot about um, what motivates me. Uh, and I've mentioned that kind of as, as we've chatted today, I think that's incredibly important for people to reflect on and think about. And so in my journey, you know, I've learned really the people I work with is a, is a key motivating factor. So the team, the people that I surround myself with. Um, so that's something to take into account when thinking about leaving a different company. You know, you don't always know what you're getting into, uh, but I'm also motivated for growth opportunities. So, you know, I just have to weigh those pros and cons, but I'm certainly very, very happy at Kraft Heinz. Again, a really wonderful group of people, very creative, um, voracious learners. Um, so I think it's very a good spot for me right now in terms of what I'm learning here. Working at a Kraft Heinz is a large global company. So I've only had small company and startup experience prior to Kraft Heinz. So being here is helping me learn about how to operate in a larger, larger company, a global company. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, I have big goals to make a direct impact. You know, I want to help planet Earth. I want to create more sustainable solutions. Um, if I feel like there are opportunities that I can, I can do that elsewhere, you know, maybe someday I'll, I'll find myself somewhere else. But it's great, interesting great that you here. have, you have done that in your career. You have really never strayed very far from your interest in sustainability and for lack of a better term, green science. Yeah. And, and, and it, and you, and I, I think you have a lot to be proud of. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about this. May I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. So if you had someone who was recently earning their PhD and they were in the microbial sciences, which I'm told I have to say instead of microbiology these days, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, what advice would you give them about considering a move into industry? Yeah, keep an open mind. Uh, don't rule it out. I struggled coming out of PhD. You know, we didn't talk career a ton maybe in grad school, and I should have done more of that. But I struggled with some of that guilt. Like I felt like, oh, you're not supposed to go into industry. Um, and I, yeah, I think uh, overall, I feel like we've moved on from that or moving on from that. Um, mm -hmm. So don't have that guilt. And have an open mind to it, to experiments. You can learn so much by trying something out. Again, I was not 
anticipating I wanted to be in business, found myself at Blue Marble, really loved it. So you can have a plan, but be willing to try things out. And there are folks that have gone into industry and gone back to academia. So there's no reason why you'll pigeon your hole yourself. Um, yeah, you yourself have, have made that uh, boomerang kind of approach. And, and, it's, and I think that one of the things that you've said multiple times is the value of networking. Um, and a lot of folks are uncomfortable with it, but the majority of time when I've been outside academia, that's how everything works is via networking. And actually in academia, it's taking place too. It just isn't called that as much. Hmm. And, and so that sounds like another piece of good advice that you might give people. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I, um, being a part of industry groups, you know, grad school is part of ASM. So yeah, that is networking. Maybe you won't call it that, but that's how you may find other research partners or where you might find your future postdoc labs. So that that is important. Um, even on the industry side, I'm still involved in industry groups. So to learn, because I don't have a food science background, to learn more about food science in the food industry, I um, volunteer with IFT, the Institute Institute for Food Technologists. Um, and that's been a great way to expand my network, learn more about the food industry. And um, I currently chair our sustainable food systems division in IFT. Yeah. Look at you. Thanks. Yeah, it's exciting. So as we start to kind of close things up here, I, I, I ask a question generally, and I'm really curious about this from you, because for good or for ill, I think that we see the world in similar ways, Franny. We do. I don't know. I don't know if that's an, an insult good, to both. We're doing well. <laughs> so here, what is the one thing that happened to you that sold you on thinking microbiologically? There, there's always one thing. Yeah, I really think it comes back to that paper you shared with me. So it really clicked on this kind of a concept of an invisible ecosystem. Um, just that unseen world. And I think a few, many of your other guests have mentioned that same thing. And that's really, I don't know, I can't really describe it, but to me, that's what hooked me. Just this, mm -hmm. this world um, that we cannot see that's vital to our everyday life, vital to planet Earth. It's just amazing. And it still piques my curiosity today and drives me today. That's it's wonderful. Wonder. You know, you know, when I've worked in ASM a few years ago and we were talking about outreach and there were some folks who were involved in the more business end of microbiology that felt that they weren't getting enough attention. And I worked with Amy Chang Vollmer and some other people to make sure that they had a platform and there were there was a lot of interest. So there's there's all kinds of directions out there. And I think you're right that in some ways people are told there's only one route if you're a, if you're a scientist, and it's just not true. Furthermore, it's never been true. Right. We just tend we just tend to hear what we want to hear sometimes. So success stories like yours are very very important for people to hear. Yeah, it's been an interesting path, and I completely agree. We only hear what we want to hear. Maybe we can do a better job talking about it. So I'm I'm glad to share my journey today. And even when we think industry, I, from my perspective, like I never thought food industry, so I'm not sure many other microbiologists do as well. You know, you kind of think pharma typically when you think industry, mm -hmm. uh, but, but there are many other uh, opportunities. And as we know, microbiology uh, in our microcentric worldview, you know, it's critical to everything. Um, Everyone needs microbiologists, so great job, security. First evolved, last extinct. There we go. You know, and it's like the old joke that uh, Dean Martin said back in the days of the Rat Pack about Frank Sinatra. He said, it's Frank's world, we just live in it. And that's absolutely true for microbiology. It is a microbial planet. I agree. Franny, thank you so much for spending time talking with me today on this podcast. It is such a pleasure to see you happy and successful. Mark, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and yeah, thanks for the positive impact you've had on my life and my career. Forever grateful. Oh.
Well, you are just the best. It comes as no surprise to anyone who've watched you today that many times when you were in my lab, people would describe you as being the camp counselor we always wished we had. And I was a camp counselor. Lo love camp. So there you go. My very best wishes and congratulations again on your wedding. Thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. This has been Matters Microbial a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with some wonderful links as always, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Francis Gilman, Franny, is a principal scientist at the Kraft Heinz Corporation in Illinois. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reaper Clark, as always, for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.